Okay, so first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers uh, for gathering us virtually at this nice conference. I will talk about lepton masses and mixing from residual modular symmetries. And this is based on uh, our recent work in collaboration with my uh, PhD advisor, Sergei Petkov, and uh, with uh, Joao Pineda, who is currently a postdoc at uh, CFTP in Lisbon. So I will start directly with the most important slide. Um, which lists the takeaways of this talk and also serves me as an outline. So there are basically three messages I'd like to convey with this talk. The first one is that the flavor structure of the standard model may be a hint for new physics for a more fundamental description of particles. Uh, secondly, um, the uh, a promising approach uh, to this problem is uh, given by modular symmetry, which is a predictive framework for describing flavor. And in particular, hierarchical mass patterns arise naturally within this framework, as was shown recently in our paper, which I will review as well. So the rest of the talk will be just me elaborating on these three points one by one. Let me start with the first one and discuss the flavor structure as a hint for new physics. So as we know, uh, in, the, in the standard model, there are five uh, fermions, which were copy pasted three times during the act of creation. So each fermion comes in three families or generations of flavors, which interact the same way. Uh, they uh, have the same representations, but for some reason, uh, there are three copies of each of them. And uh, this is a longstanding problem in particle physics, which is referred to as the flavor problem or family problem, which can be summarized as follows. And the family problem occurs when three generations have to live together. So we know what this means for humans, but what does this mean for particles? And to see that, let's first uh, recall what are the flavor observables. So it turns out that uh, they arise from the mass terms, because as soon as you uh, form a mass term with two fermions, you immediately get nine terms instead of just one, because each generation can couple to each generation. And so instead of just one mass parameter, you get a three by three mass matrix. Uh, for example, uh, uh, these are the mass matrices relevant for charged leptons and for neutrinos. Now, since the uh, generations are indistinguishable, you can in principle rotate them in an arbitrary way. And in this way, you can uh, simplify the mass matrices, diagonalizing them. And this yields uh, the observable, the actual observable masses of charged leptons and of neutrinos. However, as you can see, one of the fields, L, participates in both of the mass matrices, which means that once you diagonalize one of the mass matrices, you cannot diagonalize the other one. This means that there is some mismatch between the diagonalizing basis, which is encoded in the so-called mixing matrix, and it depends on a few more parameters which are observable. These are the mixing angles and the uh, CP violating phases. So um, the flavor observables are masses and mixing parameters which arise from the mass matrices. And here comes the first annoyance because if you list all the parameters of the standard model, you will see that uh, at least 80% of all the parameters uh, are precisely these flavor observables which suggests that there might be probably a simpler way to describe them than just hard code them into the theory. Moreover, since different generations are so similar in other ways, one might assume that, for example, their masses should be of the same order, but this turns out not to be the case. Within each generation, the masses are vastly different, and the masses of neutrinos are many orders of magnitude smaller than any other masses. Also, if you look at the mixing matrices, you will see that they are quite far from generic. This is especially obvious in the case of the quarks, the CKM mixing matrix shown here on the right, which is very close to a diagonal matrix, despite the fact that generically it could be anything. Uh, in the case of the lepton mixing matrix, the PMNS matrix, uh, this is, uh, it, it's, it's not so, uh, close to a diagonal one, but still it exhibits some structure. For example, you can notice that it's one three entry is very small. Its second row is uh, almost equal to its third row. And all the entries in the second column are approximately equal to each other. 
So these peculiar patterns um, constitute uh, what is called the flavor problem or the flavor puzzle, which is uh, in principle not a problem in the sense that it doesn't lead to any inconsistencies. However, these peculiar patterns suggest that there might be some, something we are missing here. And probably the most natural uh, approach to resolve this issue uh, in view of uh, these almost symmetric patterns and in view of the fact that different generations are so similar to each other in other respects is the symmetry approach. In other words, one introduces a new uh, flavor, uh, a new symmetry group G, which is called a flavor symmetry, which mixes different generations. So different generations are just facets of uh, the same object. And there are multiple ways of doing this. I will just give you uh, two famous examples. One of them is the Robert Nielsen approach, uh, where, where one uh, imposes a U1 symmetry with different generations having different charges under this symmetry and they couple to a, a scalar field, to different powers of a scalar field, which in the end produces a hierarchical mass matrix, like the one shown here. And this is very nice to explain the hierarchies. However, uh, it, it lacks uh, any other predictive power because in front of each of these entries, there is actually an order one parameter, which is undetermined by this symmetry. So, um, and the predictivity is not so high. Also, this approach typically uh, predicts small mixing angles, which is okay for quarks, but not so nice for leptons. Uh, and for the leptons, on the other hand, a very popular approach is based on discrete symmetries, which allows to uh, reproduce uh, the observed BMNS matrix or something very close to it. So it's very uh, good for, for the lepton mixing. On the other hand, it doesn't tell you anything about hierarchies. And moreover, it is very difficult to implement such a uh, scheme because one has to um, impose a, a, a very complicated symmetry breaking sector in the theory. So this is to, just to say that despite three decades of efforts in this direction, there is uh, still no compelling answer or solution to the flavor puzzle. And in view of this, it is very natural to seek for some other approaches and one of these uh, unexplored avenues is um, to assume that the flavor symmetry is actually realized in a nonlinear way, so that it doesn't only mix the generations, but does something else to them in a more complicated way. And the prominent example of such uh, symmetry is uh, modular symmetry. So modular symmetry is um, a good um, example because uh, that on the one hand it is motivated by top-down constructions like string theories or theories with extra dimensions and on the other hand one can use it in the uh, bottom-up perspective without appealing to a specific top-down construction and still extract some uh, predictions out of it. So just to give you an idea how modular symmetry may arise in the quantum field theory, let's imagine a theory with two extra dimensions compactified. So we can think of them as a, uh, as a, as a grid which repeats itself along two directions, E1 and E2. And the geometry of the compactification is described by one complex parameter called the modulus, which is just the ratio of the two uh, uh, vectors, uh, basis vectors E1 and E2 treated as complex uh, variables. So the low energy effective field theory will depend on the value of tau. But the interesting thing is that you can describe the same grid with a different pair of basis vectors. So the compactification will be the same, but the modulus parameter will be different. And since the actual physics depends only on the geometry, on the compactification of the compactification, this means that uh, different values of tau should lead to the same values of observables, meaning that the low energy effective theory has to be invariant under such transformations. So these transformations form a group which is called the modular group. And despite its fancy name, it's just a group of two by two matrices with integer entries and a unit determinant. So it describes uh, simply a change of basis on this grid. And if you consider uh, other fields in this theory, it turns out that they depend on, that they also transform uh, under such transformations in the following way. So first of all, they mix with a unitary representation of the modular group. 
which happens also for linearly realized symmetries. But in this case, there is also an extra prefactor depending on tau and also on uh, a number, an integer number k, which is the modular weight. So this shows that in, in this setup, uh, fields transform uh, non-linearly. And the idea now is to identify this symmetry with flavor symmetry. So we will assume that this index i here enumerates different generations of one fermion. So at this point, we can uh, forget about the top-down motivations. So we just have a group of two by two integer matrices that act on the modular style with fractional linear transformations and which acts on the fields as shown here. Uh, and we can try to construct uh, invariants which we can include in our Lagrangian. For instance, if we consider interaction terms of n different fields, we write a coupling in front of it, white y of tau, which can depend on the modulus. And from the transformation rule of these fields, we can deduce that the coupling itself should transform in a similar way. First of all, it has to compensate the overall weight of these fields. And it can also uh, mix with uh, mix among itself so that we can extract a singlet out of the product of, of these uh, representation matrices as is usually done with linearly realized symmetries. So the only difference here is that we have these weight prefactors. Uh, so we see that the coupling has to transform in a way similar to the fields, but the difference is that the coupling is just a mathematical function. We can write its uh, transformation property just as a constraint on a function. Uh, these functions are very well studied in mathematics. They're called modular forms. They are very important, for example, in number theory. But what's more important for us is that uh, there are only a few of them once we specify the weight which means that uh, the couplings in the end are determined by a few, uh, by a small number of uh, well-known functions. If you apply this uh, to the mass matrices, you get some expressions like the ones shown in this slide, which depend on a few known modular forms and on a few parameters like tau and uh, a few coupling constants. And in order to obtain these masses, the only, the only thing you have to do is to choose the field representations and weights under the modular group. Once you specify them, you immediately get the predictions for the mass matrices from which you can extract the predictions for the observables. Uh, so a lot of uh, models of this kind have been already proposed, but the problem with most of them is that they still don't explain any flavor patterns, which means that if you choose some generic values of these parameters, tau, g1, and so on, you typically get generic values of the observables. For example, the electron mass will be the same order as the muon mass, and this is not what we want. So in order to obtain a small electron mass, one has to rely on some cancellations or fine tunings of these parameters. So we uh, addressed this uh, problem in our recent work. Uh, and the idea is uh, as follows. So, uh, the first observation is that um, the modulus can be assumed to lie in, in this green region shown in this figure, which is called the fundamental domain of the modular group. And this is because you, whenever two values of the modulus are related by a modular symmetry, they should lead to an equivalent physics, which means that uh, uh, you can apply a modular transformation to a modulus, no matter which modulus you start with, so that it um, is mapped to this green region. So without loss of generality, we can assume that the modulus belongs to the green region. Uh, secondly, um, whenever you choose a value of the modulus, you break the modular symmetry completely because no value of tau can be invariant under fractional linear transformations. However, there exist three values of the modulus which break the modular symmetry only partially. Um, which means that each of them is invariant under one of the modular transformations. So a small abelian group is uh, unbroken. And here comes the key idea, because if we choose the value of the modulus to be one of these symmetric values, it means that we have an unbroken symmetry in our theory. 
And this symmetry may forbid certain terms in the Lagrangian, uh, making some of the flavor observables vanish. For example, you can have a vanishing electron mass at tau equals i. And this means that if you depart a bit from tau equals i, then the electron mass will become non-zero, but still it should be much smaller than any other mass. And in this way, uh, you could try to reproduce the observed hierarchies of the masses. So this is what we did. Uh, we studied. Okay, thank you. So we studied the behavior of the mass matrices in the vicinity of symmetric points. And it turns out that it can be done in a systematic way. We start with the representations of the participating fields under the modular group. From this, we can infer their representations under the unbroken residual group, which is just a subgroup of the modular group. And it turns out that these decompositions uh, determine the structure of the mass matrix in the vicinity of the symmetric point. It turns out that it looks, uh, it has a hierarchical structure similar to the one in the froggatt nielsen approach. But the difference here is that uh, in front of each entry, uh, the coefficient is uh, completely fixed by the modular symmetry. So it's not an arbitrary number anymore. So the next step is uh, to obtain the uh, orders of masses in this mass matrix. So the key results are, first of all, that it is in principle possible to obtain hierarchical masses within this setup, which is not obvious from the outset because it might happen that even if several observables are suppressed by epsilon, they could be suppressed by the same power of epsilon. However, it turns out that uh, with a suitable choice of modular group representations, uh, the different masses will be suppressed with different powers of epsilon, and this is precisely what we need. And the second result is that we listed uh, uh, all possible field representations which uh, yield such hierarchical masses, and this is very important for the uh, model building because it allows us to constrain the theory space very significantly. So we can ignore most choices of modular group representations and concentrate only on the ones that yield the hierarchical masses. Uh, so as an example, we have considered a model which leads to hierarchical masses. Uh, in a similar way, by the way, one can constrain the representations um, so that the resulting mixing will be large, which is important for leptons. And among these models, we have chosen the one which has the smallest number of parameters. Uh, so we ended up with a model uh, with, with a specification of the modular group representations and weights, which we study in the vicinity of uh, one of the symmetric points, the cusp, e to the 2 pi i over 3. So when you calculate the mass matrices in the vicinity of this point, you get uh, the following formulas. So as you can see, uh, the uh, charged lepton mass matrix has different powers of epsilon in it, which allows to reproduce the hierarchical uh, charged lepton masses. So the lightest mass will be order epsilon squared, uh, the muon mass will be order epsilon, and the tau mass will be uh, order epsilon to the zero. On the other hand, the neutrino mass matrix is uh, not constrained by uh, is not hierarchical because uh, epsilon factorizes. So if you fit this, uh, these matrices to the observed data, you will find that the parameters are order one. And moreover, you can vary each of them in quite broad ranges without significantly affecting the observables, which means that uh, in this case, we were able to avoid any fine tuning, which is uh, very, uh, unusual for these type of models. So I think it's safe to say that this is the first uh, modular invariant model, which is free of fine tuning. And apart from uh, reproducing the observed uh, hierarchical masses of charged leptons, it also uh, predicts some, some of the yet unmeasured lepton uh, flavor observables. It predicts the lightest neutrino mass to be zero, which gives the sum of neutrino masses uh, roughly 0.059 electron volts, it predicts the CP violating phase to be very close to the CP conserving value of pi, but it also predicts the uh, effective uh, Majorana mass for neutrinoless double beta decay, 
to be roughly 1.5 million electron volts. So with this, uh, I would like to conclude and show you once again the takeaways of this talk. So we have seen that flavor structure may be a hint for new physics and modular symmetry is a predictive framework for describing flavor, which is a promising research direction in this uh, field. And in particular, hierarchical mass patterns may arise naturally within uh, this framework. Uh, so with this, I'd like to complete my presentation and uh, thank you for listening. Thanks a lot for your talk. Are there questions for Pavel, comments? So Elidro, as his hand raised. Uh, okay. So uh, I would like to ask, uh, as far as I understand in this uh, uh, model, uh, there isn't a mass scale. Uh, so where a mass scale arise uh, and uh, uh, is it legitimate to think uh, that this symmetry should be applied also to uh, quarks? Um, so the first question uh, is, is about the mass scale. In fact, it is there. Uh, so I, I've written here that the mass matrices are proportional to these expressions because there is also an overall factor which also depends on the coupling constants. So the scales are, are, are present. Um, and concerning the uh, quarks, uh, I think that it can be applied uh, in a straightforward way to the quarks as well. Uh, in some sense, it might be even easier because it is easier to obtain uh, an almost diagonal mixing in the symmetric limit, uh, which is not the case for leptons. But otherwise, I think it's directly applicable to quarks as well. Um, uh, sorry, but let me ask you. Where does the mass scale uh, arise? I, I mean, it's a ratio, tau is a ratio of two coordinates, right? So... I need you, can I inter interfere? Uh, it is the vacuum expectation value of the Higgs. Okay. I mean, these are your cover couplings at the end, uh, which involve the Higgs doublet uh, in a super- so It's the electroweak scale. Electroweak scale, yes. But you, of course, I mean, you can work in a seesaw, classical seesaw at, uh, I mean, God scale type seesaw. Yes, yeah, so in this case, we actually assume uh, seesaw type one. As you can see, we introduce here um, a neutrino field mu C, which is uh, the heavy, heavy neutrinos, the Majorana neutrinos. Okay, thank you. So there is Andrea, which has his hand raised. See, I'm sorry, it's not really my field of research, but uh, I didn't get the beginning of this modular symmetry. This is a symmetry of the Lagrangian or, or what? Uh, in the end, yes, it's a symmetry of the um, Lagrangian. So um, we have ordinary fields, phi in the theory, and we have uh, a new field tau, and uh, both the ordinary fields and tau transform non-linearly under the action of this uh, symmetry. So the only difference is that uh, typically we have symmetries that are realized in a linear way, but in this case it is non-linear. Otherwise it's um, a symmetry of the Lagrangian. So in the end, we um, each term in the Lagrangian is invariant under, under this transformation rule, which, which is guaranteed by uh, these uh, transformation properties. Uh, Fabio, is his hand raised. Yeah, I would like to ask the question about mass scales in a different uh, uh, way. Uh, we know that uh, masses and you cover couplings uh, run with the renormalization scale. So we, without an underlying assumption on uh, your uh, compactified space and compactification scale, what selects uh, the scale at which uh, these uh, symmetries should be valid. Uh, so this is, uh, from, from the bottom-up perspective, this is undetermined. In principle, it could be anything. Uh, the only um, uh, important point is that uh, in, in this uh, setup, we actually assume supersymmetry, which means that this scale should be certainly larger than the supersymmetry super breaking scale, but otherwise it could be anything in principle. Um, so the, these predictions, they are actually valid at, at, at this scale. So in principle, we need to run them afterwards to the electroweak scale, for example. 
Um, so we don't um, do this for for leptons because uh, in the regime in, in this regime uh, the the running is uh, negligible for a sizable portion in the parameter space. Yes, thank you. Uh, so Andrea, do you have another question or just uh, you forgot to unraise your hand? Uh, maybe. Well, I didn't understand after the answer, I didn't understand, but uh, <laughs> I don't want to ask more. <laughs> okay, okay, so if there are no further questions, we can uh, thank all the speakers of this uh, first part of the afternoon.